Bon dia. Good morning. Bon dia a tots. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. I must say to those who do not speak Catalan that you have translation. Channel 1 is Spanish. Channel 2 is Catalan. And Channel 3 is English. Do you hear me, Satish? Yes, I'm over here. Yes, we're over here. Great. And John? Great. Good morning. <laughs> so we're going to okay, be seeing so, uh, some videos to very and to different the, things in different um, languages. Agenda, so there'll be many changes. Be some changes. So, plus, we're going so to be changing languages. Catalan, close by. Spanish, and make sure you're in Channel English, 3, which is the English channel for you. Sometimes. So do please pay attention. So thank you. Thank you very much. One for more being year. Here. here we are. Today. One more at year. this gathering that began last night yesterday. at San Fortesa at the Campo Camper Foundation. Foundation in the San Fortesa Think Camp. And, and today which we today on. continues Saturday and tomorrow and Sunday. Tomorrow as well, Sunday. And I hope and that we hope we that you enjoy, have you have a good time. And as I say as, um, every year, every the most year, important thing that will happen the most these days won't happen up here on stage. It will happen down there. Here. But they're in the happen, audience it's take and in your hearts outside between and now before we start with Satish's meditation and now before starting I'd like to welcome Satish we'd like to welcome although not all the speakers are here Umet. but we want to welcome our speakers here today Esteva Umet please yes do come up take your headphones with you Satish Take your headphones with you. Cesar Bona is here with us as well. We have Juan Boadas with us this morning. And now you can choose whether you want to keep them on or not. We have John Jandai. who comes all the way from Thailand. So we're very grateful to him for making this effort. And Satish Kumar. Okay, so we're going to begin with Satish's meditation. <coughs> to begin the meditation, we bring our both palms together and we bow to the sacred earth sacred universe, sacred life. Then you put your both hands on your knees, knees, and make a circle with the index finger and the thumb. This is in Sanskrit called mandala. The mandala, like this, it is a sign and a symbol of unity of life. Everything is connected as the thumb and index finger are connected. And also this mandala represents the cycle of time, the cycle of life. So you close your eyes. and bring yourself in this beautiful ancient church 
and in your body, totally relaxed, shoulders down, arms relaxed, front and the back of the body relaxed, legs relaxed, the head, the forehead, the eyes, the cheeks, the lips are all relaxed. In this relaxed body and still body, there are two movements, one of the mind and the other of the breath. Bring those two together and focus the mind on the breath. Breathing in, quietly say, I am breathing in. Breathing out, quietly say, I am breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. Be aware of your in-breath and be aware of your out-breath. And breathing in, smile and relax your face. And breathing out, let go. Let go of all tension, all stress, all worry, all thoughts. Breathing in, smile at the world. Breathing out, let go. Just be. Breathing in, be aware of the beginning, the middle, and the end of the in-breath. Then be aware of the turning point from the in-breath to the out-breath. And then be aware of the beginning, the middle, and the end of the out-breath. And then be aware of the turning point from the out-breath to in-breath. This is cyclical breathing mindful breathing. Keep your mind focused on your breath. And be aware that all of us in this great church are breathing the same air, same breath of life. Thus, we are all related. We are all connected. And the thumb is connected with the index finger. With that sense of unity, of all life. Breathe mindfully, heartfully, cyclically. And then be aware that all life, human life, plant life, animal life, all living beings upon this earth and in the cosmos are sustained by the same breath of life which we breathe. Thus, we are all related. We are all connected. With that sense of unity of all life, Breathe gently. We are 
connected as the thumb is connected with the index finger. The mantra Om is the mantra of wholeness, completeness, and relatedness. So let us all sing together three times the mantra Om. Breathe in. falsehood to truth. Lead me from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead me from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Peace. Peace, peace. May all beings upon this earth, humans and other than humans, live in peace, find fulfillment and self-realization. And may we all seek truth, love, Compassion, unity, beauty, and generosity in our lives. And breathe gently and deeply. And relax. Let go of all tensions. And may we offer all our thoughts, all our words, and all our actions for the well-being of all, for the well-being of all, for the well-being of all. And may we think our thoughts speak our words and perform our actions mindfully, heartfully, and with awareness throughout the day. Then there is no distinction between meditation and living. Meditation, a way of mindful and heartful living. To conclude this short meditation, we bring our both palms together again. Bring your both palms together. And we bow to the sacred earth, sacred universe, sacred life. We hold our palms together as a symbol that all opposites Complement left and right, below and above, masculine and feminine, dark and light, 
negative and positive, pain and pleasure, all opposites complement and make whole. With that sense of wholeness, completeness, and relatedness, we conclude this session of meditation. Thank you. Grazie. I sing this song, not to you, but for you. Because I know this is the truth of who we all are. <sighs> Take these words in. of it all. Some of you can tell me if whether it makes sense or if we can explain what it means to win in the world of things and to lose your soul, your inner being. Does it make sense? What time do we devote during our days to the world of things? And how much time do we devote to our inner world, to our spirits? We need to take 
the wisdom, we need to take wisdom, compassion, and love to our schools, the things that really matter. We know that many things are being done, both families as well as teachers are doing things. The government is also doing its share. However, I believe that we need to take more steps. We need to go further. And to do this, we need radical families. We also need teachers that are radical. And we need radical politicians, too. This means that we need teachers, families, and politicians who are brave. Because what we are doing what is being done, it's okay, but it's not enough. We can go farther. And for this, we need strength. Today, I want to remember a man from Santa Margarida. His name is Joan Mascaro, because I think Joan Mascaro can shed light in this sense. Today, I would like to remember some words from Joan. We have Joan's image here in this screen. Margalida Muna is here, and I want to ask her to help us organize meetings with families, with teachers, and with uh, with families, with teachers, and with politicians in all schools. Uh, so that John Mascaro is present. He wrote two books, The Creation of Faith and Lamps of Fire. Both of these books are very interesting. This man uh, is from our land, and he belongs to our culture, and I think he can help us in our path. Among other things, he said, we cannot change the world, but we can change our inner world. And it is in our inner world where we live. And that's where happiness and lack of happiness happens. Peace and doubt happen there. Happiness and sadness happen there as well as pain and pleasure. Only through meditation, contemplation, silence, unity, can we get to really know our inner world? He also said this, I have two lives, my inner life, the unspeakable, and my exterior or outward life, nature with other human beings. What two mysterious, mysterious worlds. Now, we are going to show a video that we could refer to as gratitude. We could call it gratitude. It's a video made by a um, Latin American photographer and a Benedict monk who lives in Germany. It's a video that will serve as an introduction to our next guest, who is, um, that is Cesar Bona. He's going to come here to the stage with uh, eight teenagers, and he'll spend um, 45 minutes. Hi, everybody. I feel like I'm in a revival. Message. This is great. It's great to be back in my old stomping grounds of San Francisco. When I graduated UCLA, I moved to Northern California, and I lived in a little town called Elk on the Mendocino Coast. And um, I didn't have a phone or TV, but I had U.S. mail. And uh, life was good back then, if you could remember it. Um, I'd go to the general store for a cup of coffee and a brownie, and I'd ship my film to San Francisco, and lo and behold, two days later, it would end up on my front door, which was way better than having to fight the traffic of uh, Hollywood. I didn't have much money, but I had time and a sense of wonder. So I started shooting time-lapse photography. It would take me a month to shoot a four-minute roll of film because that's all I could afford. 
I've been shooting time-lapse flowers continuously, non-stop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for over 30 years. And to see them move is a dance I'll never get tired of. Their beauty immerses us with color, taste, touch. It also provides a third of the food we eat. Beauty and seduction is nature's tools for survival because we protect what we fall in love with. It opens our hearts and makes us realize we are a part of nature and we're not separate from it. When we see ourselves in nature, it also connects us to every one of us because it's clear that it's all connected in one. When people see my images, a lot of times they'll say, oh my God. Have you ever wondered what that meant? The O means it caught your attention, it makes you present, it makes you mindful. The my means it connects with something deep inside your soul. It creates a gateway for your inner voice to rise up and be heard. And God, God is that personal journey we all want to be on, to be inspired, to feel like we're connected to a universe that celebrates life. Did you know that 80% of the information we receive comes through our eyes. And if you compare light energy to musical scales, it would only be one octave that the naked eye could see, which is right in the middle. And aren't we grateful for our brains that can you know, take this electrical impulse that comes from light energy to create images in order for us to explore our world? And aren't we grateful that we have hearts that can feel these vibrations in order for us to allow ourselves to feel the pleasure and the beauty of nature. Nature's beauty is a gift that cultivates appreciation and gratitude. So I have a gift I want to share with you today, a project I'm working on called Happiness Revealed. And it'll give us a glimpse into that perspective from the point of view of a child and an elderly man of that world. When I watch TV, it's just some shows that you just, that are pretend. And, and when you explore, you get more imagination than you already had. And um, when you get more imagination, it makes you want to go deeper in so you can get more and see beautiful things. Like it could, the path, if it's a path, it could leave you, it could lead you to a beach or something, and it could be beautiful. You think this is just another day in your life? It's not just another day. It's the one day that is given to you today. It's given to you. It's a gift. It's the only gift that you have right now. And the only appropriate response is gratefulness. If you do nothing else but to cultivate that response to the great gift that this unique day is, if you learn to respond as if it were the first day in your life, and the very last day, then you will have spent this day very well. Begin by opening your eyes and be surprised that you have eyes you can open. That incredible array of colors that is constantly offered to us for pure enjoyment. 
look at the sky. We so rarely look at the sky. We so rarely note how different it is from moment to moment with clouds coming and going. We just think of the weather. And even of the weather, we don't think of all the many nuances of weather. We just think of good weather and bad weather. This day, right now, it's unique weather. Maybe a kind that will never exactly in that form come again. The formation of clouds in the sky will never be the same that is right now. Open your eyes, look at that. Look at the faces of people whom you meet. Each one has an incredible story behind their face. A story that you could never fully fathom. Not only their own story, but the story of their ancestors. We all go back so far. And in this present moment, on this day, all the people you meet, all that life from generations and from so many places all over the world, flows together and meets you here like a life-giving water if you only open your heart and drink. Open your heart to the incredible gifts that civilization gives to us. You flip a switch and there is electric light. You turn a faucet and there is warm water and cold water and drinkable water. It's a gift that millions and millions in the world uh, will never experience. So these are just a few of an enormous number of gifts to which we can open your heart. And so I wish you that you will open your heart to all these blessings and let them flow through you. That everyone whom you will meet on this day will be blessed by you. Just by your eyes, by your smile, by your touch, just by your presence. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. And then it will really be a good day. Esto es para, yo creo que este es para ti. Este es para ti. Está por aquí. Es el Lotsco de Puja. Ok, so they're calling out for the teenagers who are meant to come on stage now. And they're not in the room. So somebody has to go and find them. Oh, there they are. Buenas tardes. <laughs> so, good morning, everyone. 
We've got a few people missing. We've got a few people missing, uh, but they're here to come. We, Victor seems to be missing because he's, ah, here he is. He tends to lose track of time. And here we go. So good morning, everyone. It really is a gift to be here once more and to begin, kick off this event. Having listened to Satish, which is always a wonderful pleasure, and to now continue talking about education with young men and women, boys and girls. About a year or so ago, I was called for an interview on the radio, and they had prepared a special program at a high school. And there was about a hundred high school kids, all sitting as you are here. And they had prepared some experts in education to talk about education, teachers, etc. We talked about education for an hour, but there was only those of us up here, the supposed experts, speaking. And I was looking at the audience, all those teenagers. At the beginning, they were listening, but they quickly lost attention. And for that whole hour, nobody asked their opinion. No one listened to them. We were talking about education, but we weren't talking about the main protagonists, which is the boys and girls. So today, we have the opportunity of beginning an event about education with the true protagonists, which is the boys and girls that we see in our classrooms every day. So we prepared this roundtable 10 minutes ago. So we're going to improvise pretty much because that is what education is about as well, is constantly improvising. So you're going to introduce yourselves. So we'll, we'll send the microphone around. So just please introduce yourselves. Say who you are, where you're from, and your age. Hi, my name is Bly. I'm 13. I'm from Bini Salem, a village here and I'm 13 years old. Hello, I'm Jeanette. I'm 19, and I'm from Australia. I'm Jenny. I'm 14, and I'm from Kostich, a village here, but I'm from England. Hello, my name is Felipe. I live in Germany, where I go to school, and I've also gone to school here, and I lived in Inca. Hello, I'm Eddie, I'm 21. I grew up in Palma, and now I live near Villafranca, which is a village here also. Hello, my name is Nico, I'm also 21. I also grew up in Palma, where I grew up, and 10 minutes ago, I didn't know I was gonna be up here, so this is a surprise for me. It's interesting. Oh, here we go, we've got a couple more. It's interesting because outside we were talking at the table just before beginning, and the first thing they asked me, I found interesting. They said, is there anything we cannot talk about? Is there anything we cannot say? And I said to them, no, this is the moment to say those things that normally you're not able to say, not allowed to say. That may seem paradoxical, but we're here these days to talk about life. And so we have the opportunity, those of us who are there listening now, have the opportunity to learn from all the people we're going to listen to. So we will also make a, an introduction as to where we started studying, because when we were meeting each other outside, there was different options. And we talked about some kids who are doing homeschooling, which is a very difficult option to understand for some people. And I know we're going to do another round where at some point we're, this is going to turn into a conversation as if we were having a coffee around a table. So if there's at any point you want to ask something, if there's something you're curious about, if there's something here that provokes 
curiosity in you, please raise your hand and share it with us, because I'd like this to be a dialogue amongst 500 people. So any one of you can say anything. So please tell us where you studied as a kid. Hi, sorry I'm late. My name is Victor, and I studied in a school called Queen's College, which is in Geneva. It's a private school. It's an English school. And I stopped when I went to high school, and I started to do other things then. You'd lost the notion of time uh, just recently? Yes, well, we thought it was at 10.15, but... So where did you study? I started studying at the Sacred Heart School, a religious school in Palma, and I was there until the... Uh, until the fourth year, well, beginning of high school, and then I had to repeat that year in another school, and then I didn't finish my training due to family difficulties, and so I had to get to work. I also started at the Sacred Heart Religious School, and then high school, I did it in Lasai, which are both concerted schools, they're called which is partly religious, but funded by the state. And then I continued at Ramon Llui, which is a public school. I went to school at Sayabor, the school that Satish knows well. And then for high school, I went to a Waldorf school, where I am now. I went to Sayabor as well, the Echo School here until high school, and now I'm at a private school that's called King Riches. I went to Bini Salem public school as a child, and then I went to another public school in a different, in a smaller village with only 10 students. And then I went to another village in Bujer, and I was there for a few months. And then we went to Kostit, and I ended up in Sineu, where I did high school. I started at three years old at Sayabar, the Echo School, and I'm still there at the Echo School, Sayabar. Hello, my name is Juana, I'm 19. I studied in Poyenza here, in this village here. I've changed a few schools. I also went for one year to the Echo School, Sayabar, when I was 10. And then at high school, I went to the high school, the bigger high school in the big city. So I'd like you from now on to raise your hand when you want to speak. I want you to tell us what you remember about school and what you think school has brought to you. What do you think it's useful for? For me, basically it's about relating to other people. So it's about social relations. And it's very different, as we were saying earlier, between Sayabor, the Echo School, or Waldorf School, and a conventional public school, like state school. In Sayabor, you learn things at the Echo School. You learn things about valuing nature, relating to other people. It shows you perhaps a different way of perceiving things, of understanding things, and deciding the kind of life you want to live. And then the state school gives you a lot of content. It's also great, and it shows you different areas of learning. But I've also realized that what is missing in one is in the other. I don't think either of them are the complete experience that I feel should be education. So what would be that completeness? Well, it should open up the opportunities for other possibilities and for seeing things differently, yes. And at the same time, it should teach you content and mix you up with people of all types and of all social levels. And I feel that both are positive and they're very different and I'd like to kind of bring them together. I think that would be a good experiment. I believe that right now we live in a society where there is a system and very clear structures and ways in which we must behave. And in my opinion, 
school is preparing us to fit into that system. And if we don't fit in that system, what is done in conventional education is to set you apart or give you bad grades or even put you in different classrooms of people who have more trouble learning or have learning difficulties, who are perhaps not good at sitting for hours in a classroom at a desk in silence. And I feel that those kinds of people with a more practical type of education, more movement, would be much more capable of doing many more things than they're given the opportunity to do. So I think that school is a way to prepare you to enter a system. And what we need to change is the concepts of what we want to teach people. Many teachers want to show different ways of education and different concepts and different schools, but perhaps they're not given the opportunity either because it, we wouldn't fit as well in that system that is so structured and where everyone is the same. If everyone did what we liked, we wouldn't fit in. So I feel that there needs to be like a balance. Conventional school, Uh, rather than helping us learn for ourselves and think for ourselves, it tries to fill our heads with information. And what would be beautiful is to join up both. I think everything is a process and change, and it's going to be a change with different phases. And as Juana was saying, joining both concepts, I think it is interesting. Sorry. Bringing both together will involve a change. And many alternative schools do it in a more isolated or separate way from the real world, quote unquote. It's kind of bringing both together and bringing a change would be interesting. And I feel that education is the responsibility of the community as well, of society itself. And that oftentimes, we think that by putting a kid into school, we can forget about his or her education because the school is going to give them the right tools when that's not the case, in fact. So for me, education, a correct education, would be the one that helps people by giving them tools to get to know themselves and overcome their own challenges, which we all have because we all have different things to learn about ourselves and different issues to work on. And so it's about preparing people to overcome those issues and overcome themselves. I feel that the most important thing in education should be to empower people, to believe in themselves. Because what you believe of yourself and what can be possible is what will or might happen. I've heard the word tools a couple of times and educating for life. We were talking as well earlier this morning. Jenny, as you've been in different schools, you said, when I was a child, the school I was at was okay, but now I learn things that are more useful. And we've reached a kind of understanding. Is that useful for what? Because we often become more focused on what we want to do now as we're coming into adulthood. But talking about the tools you were given in the schools that you've been at, what kind of tools do you think you were given? You can all say here. What tools were you given and what tools should be given in schools? Well, at Sayavor, I learned things that are useful for me in normal life. For example, how to talk to people every day, how to relate to nature, how to see the world in a different way. And I use that every day. I use it in school, in regular school now, to make friends. So I use all those skills every day. But I have an idea of what I want to study. And the things I do in my new school, which is a regular state school, are more useful to me to, for example, be able to study psychology which is something I'm very interested in. So I'm learning stuff that is useful for me at university. Whereas at Sayavor, the Echo School, I learned um, 
we talked about education for life. It's interesting because schools should be made to educate you for life, give you tools for now. Often they say we need to give students tools for the future. That's kind of a set expression. But maybe it's more about giving tools for now. So those tools that you achieved or that you were taught in Sayabor, the Echo School, perhaps don't seem to be as useful for you now, but they are very useful and they were very useful for you. So as you were saying, Joanna, perhaps we give a lot of content in, in the schools. What tools do you feel should be in the schools? I think that today's schools, the normal thing, or is based on the Fordian system. Everything is systematic, and we're not advancing with society. So I think we should be teaching more technology in the schools, things that are of daily use, daily interaction. Not to make people smaller, allow people to express their opinions and their ideas, to feel validated in order to take on their dreams. And you're not taught that in school. I think that's what makes us special as people, as individuals. That's what makes us different from each other. Oh, I lost the thought. It's true that I think that one of the tools that you should receive in school is, as you were saying, the empowerment to believe that anything you want to do is actually possible if you are uh, willing. When I was talking about the two types of schooling earlier, what I would like to mix in that idyllic school where all the tools are present is that a state school or a conventional school puts you in touch with different branches of knowledge. And that gives you the opportunity of then choosing what you would like to do and continue along. And I think that is important. And it's also important to create an environment in which it's possible to choose freely what type of society we want to live in, for example. And the school should have tools for that as well. That's basically my thought. Yeah, but by the time the microphone got to me, I also lost my thought. It's about giving you tools to feel empowered, yes. And also, I find there's a very important point, which is that in this society, we're very dependent on petrol, on this hierarchy, and it's like your survival depends on that. And I find that nowadays with climate change and so many things that are happening, I feel that it is time. When I talk about empowerment, I also mean to learn certain techniques and ways of life that are being forgotten. So for example, working the land, growing our food, how to self-supply what our needs. In Mallorca, the, my teacher, Miquel Ramis, has taught me a lot about this. 98% of what we see here on the islands is imported from outside the island. And it all depends on petrol to get here. So if, if petrol was to was to finish, it wouldn't even take three days for all the food on the island to, to disappear, to be finished. So what will we do? So I think we need to take some steps back and go back to the root of things and to how we really work and what we have left to one side, the spiritual side, the natural side of Mother Earth, which I feel is really important. And the world, the planet, is is really raising the alarm in many ways, is raising the red flag. And to have these ideas, Victor, where did that come from? 
Well, I I stopped school after high school because for me it was a challenge. It was difficult. There was nothing there that really motivated me. I had not found my real motivation. And for me, it was difficult to study something that I didn't believe in or that I did, just didn't understand why I needed to study that. And so luckily, my aunt is Mandy, who runs Permamed as an organization and who right now also run the Kumar School, Escola Kumar. And thanks to her, since I was a young child, I was doing permaculture courses. I didn't think it was very important at the time, but when I came out of school and finished ESO, I started to do different courses of things that I was interested in. So I massage, mountain guide, varied things like that. And then what I realized is that the things that really attracted me were this whole issues of how we need to change and work on ourselves in order to favor your surroundings. And that's where my satisfaction started to emerge. So I started to train in things like bioconstruction, doing a permaculture PDC with other young kids from the area. And from that point on, I continued working and studying in those kinds of things, which I'm very interested in. And I'm very interested in it because it empowers you. And little by little, I'm starting to believe that we can create what we want, that if we feel valid and capable, we can do it. And right now with Permamed, we're doing vegetable gardens, growing food for private people with Eddie and with other colleagues. And it's very empowering to feel that you can create your own job in doing what you want, what you like. So I'm learning and working and working on a lot of things. So you work together with Eddie? Could you explain to us a little bit, Eddie, a bit more about that, what you do? Now I consider that I am still in training, that you never finish learning, and that there's a lot that I still have to learn about what I like, which is plants and nature in general, and how to learn how to use plants and connect with nature. What we're mainly doing now and learning is to design and maintain vegetable gardens and with Julio Cantos and with the Permamed project as well, we I'm starting to to also give back to some of the schools on the island, working with them and advising them on what they can do that is in resonance with the environment. Contrary to what tends to happen with traditional agriculture. So I feel we need to walk along this permaculture path. Perhaps some of us like more plants, others like more bioconstruction. So we each are finding what we like. We grow together, we help each other out. And at school, what were you taught about respecting the environment? The truth is that recycling and not much more. So I think it would be, I think that's very, it's a bit too basic. I think it's not very rooted in us. I think you need to find really more interesting stuff outside of school. It's something I have to say, you know, we've done this ourselves, like we found our own ways. Seeing plants as something alive, not like in the cities where plants are decoration. And so does this, in the schools, if tools should be given for today, for the future, respecting the environment, is something secondary? I think it is, because we see ourselves as superior to other races and to other animals, and we don't uh, realize that we are part of an ecosystem. We go to the streets, and everything is built. Everything has been man-made. Everything is artificial, houses, streets, cars, everything. So we don't realize that we are living in a planet. There are ecosystems, there, and the ecosystem is working by itself, and we are apart from it. We're separate. We are not connected to living things, and we don't realize that maybe we could live together with things. We are always going to be privileged, but we should respect the earth where we live. 
So I think we have a great opportunity. We are talking to 500 teachers. I would like you to tell them what teachers could do to help support their respect to nature. Because um, what we learn here, we are going to implement in our schools on Monday. So what can we tell teachers? I think there are many things that should be taught about nature. There are many things to learn that we still don't know. But it is very important to make children aware, children, because they are the ones who um, have the future in their hands, that everything is alive, that everything has a conscious, and that can be shown through experiments that have been carried out with plants, with water, light, and individuals affect how the experiment um, the experiment's results by their actions. If you talk positively to a plant, um, that has an outcome. If you talk properly to a plant, uh, it's going to thrive. If you don't, it's going to wilt. So what we do really affect the environment. I have always been interested in nature, in respecting animals. I always had that within me, but it was inside. Two years ago, I met Satish. And Satish uh, said, you talk a lot about respecting people, but you forget to talk about respecting nature. That's what Satish told me. So that was a breakthrough for me. It's not enough to um, experience things. I also have to transmit what I feel to other people. So that's something that we need to do. We, uh, we work every day with hundreds and hundreds of students, and we need to not only invite you to do things. No, we need to invite you to become the protagonists in the change that we need to believe in. I don't know if I made this question uh, last year or not. I would like to ask you something. Those of you who have done something in relation with nature, last year, please raise your hands. Raise your hands, all of you who have worked in connection with nature. Those of you who just raised your hands because uh, everyone was doing it, don't worry about it. I think this is a good moment to say that from here until the end of the year, we should all commit to doing something. We are talking about nature. So let's commit to do some, doing something connected to nature and social engagement. We should do something with our students. If we just think about things and we don't experiment them, it's difficult to transmit it to our students. So um, maybe, I don't know, do you want to add something in connection with this? I think it's very, very important that teachers are an example uh, of respect to nature as well as a role model in terms of respecting others. Teachers need to be a role model in terms of empathy. Empathy can create environments where people respect each other and people respect nature. And I think that's what matters, not only in terms of the environment, but also in a more global sense. Yesterday was the International uh, Teachers' Day. So with this in mind, I want you to think about a teacher who really influenced you in a positive or negative way. So can you please um, share your experience about this teacher who really influenced you? I have a teacher who really inspired me. His name is Manuel, and he served as a mirror for my evolution. I took his um, grace, his kindness, his teachings, um, because a teacher in San Javors is not only a teacher. He or she is also a friend who will be with you all throughout your life. If you have problems, you can, touch to, you can talk sorry, to this person. Um, and I also have this in my school now. Um, the fact that I can talk to a teacher with a with, uh, special connection, this very ancient connection between student and, and teacher. We need to put an end to this separation. We need to see each other as equals. 
uh, it's not only teachers who teach students. Students also teach teachers. It's a, an ongoing learning path. Yeah, but many people will say that discipline is important, right? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? About the importance of discipline? How do you say this? How can you say this? I mean that many people may think, well, are we equal? Well, I'm the teacher and you're my student. Those of us here are probably the ones that have a more open mind, but we know that this approach of um, discipline exists. It's, uh, it's out there. Well, discipline comes because at the end of the day, you are learning something. And if you want to learn more, you are going to pay more attention. You are going to be more careful and you are going to listen. Of course, there are also cases where you are not motivated and, and you're not going to listen. So teachers should look for a way to teach. Sorry, I interrupted you. We were talking about influences, right? What Felipe said before that in Sallavos, we have a very special connection with our teachers is true. I have a teacher, Sofia, with whom I was very close. She always helped me with everything. She was like my aunt. I don't know how to explain it. She was like family to me. I could tell her things, not only in relation with the school. I could tell her things that were related to my friends or my family outside the school. I think it, it's important in your education to have someone outside your family, your parents or siblings. It's important to have an adult that you can talk to outside of your family. Who can you mention? Any teacher? <laughs> well, uh, my teacher is not here in the room. I had a teacher who taught philosophy with values and who influenced students in a, in a very interesting way. He was more than a teacher. Um, and this teacher that I'm talking about is a, a teacher in a TV series. And this teacher in a TV series was someone who supported students. And I really like this, this character in the series. Any influence that you want to mention? I am also going to talk about Manuel. Felipe also mentioned him. I have studied in Sallavor forever. And as Jenny was said, Manuel is like an uncle to me. He's always there and to support you, to talk to you. And maybe he will crack a joke. And he's always there. I think a teacher who really, really influenced me was a philosophy teacher that I had in Inca. Basically, there's something that I think is very, very important in a teacher that really touches students, and that is that teachers are passionate about what they teach. And that's what really got to me. This teacher was really passionate about what he was teaching, and he was always looking for the funnest way to transmit it. And that was difficult because we were in the last year high school. Um, the curriculum was very, very dense, and, and every, the class was very, very intense. And when his classes were finished, I was just uh, awestruck. And I think it's very important for teachers who transmit that if they really want to reach to students. We were talking about being passionate about what you do. You also talked about um, teachers being like a friend, like an aunt or an uncle, someone who listens to you. We are talking about those characteristics that you really admire in your teachers. Something that I can't stand and that I have a hard time dealing with is discipline and authority. Someone who wants to tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Um, people who say, who teachers who say that they are above you. And with this approach, students are not going to hear you. 
um, I had a teacher who really influenced me in the first year of high school. Um, this teacher was very, very, was he was very, very strict in terms of what he was teaching, but he was really good, so I learned a lot. Um, it's a shame that some teachers are just there because they want to get a paycheck at the end of the of the month, and and you can feel that. Sometimes there are teachers who could be teaching more things and they don't want to cover more because um, they don't want to get in trouble, they don't want to make that effort. I want to tell you an anecdote. I had this teacher who taught you, who taught us, sorry, all the um, theory of the evolution. He taught us Darwin in one week so that he could spend another week explaining us all the criticism that had been done to Darwin. For example, the lost link or the evolution of bat, things that uh, challenged Darwin's theory. So after hearing Darwin and uh, criticism to Darwin, we were like, well, and now what? Now what do we do? And his answer was, well, think, think for yourselves, look for research. And, and this teacher helped us to to teach some students um, did it and and researched more and some others just took the test and forgot about it so for me that's a teacher someone who uh, makes you go farther and to help you and uh, look for what you like I think in, in conventional school I didn't find many motivating um, teachers. I can tell you about negative experiences, but that would be a waste of time. But when I started working in bioconstruction in the Permavet community, I found people who are passionate for what they do, who are very motivated. And I found people who make you think for yourselves and question things. And people who help you and not believe things just because. Being a teacher is a great responsibility. It's a wonderful and beautiful job. You are training the future generations, and, and that is very worth it. So I think teachers should be passionate and should remember us what things are rooted in. And it's not as though everyone should work in, in the fields. No, there are thousands of professions and jobs that you can do. But there are certain things that we should never forget about. And as I was saying before, um, teachers should empower, should be positive, and that's pretty much it. And I think discipline can be necessary, but when people are not happy. Discipline is necessary when people are not happy. And I think sometimes teachers find that students um, have problems that come from their homes, and sometimes those things cannot be fixed in a schoolroom. But schools should be places where students feel safe to talk and to share. Felipe, before this uh, meeting, we were talking about our experiences in the different schools that you went to, and you said that you had gone to school here, and then you moved to Germany, and that you missed something in Germany. What was that? When I finished uh, the ESO primary school here, I moved to Germany, and I started going to a Waldorf school. In this Waldorf school, there are 400 students, and what I realized is that in Sallavors, um there were 100 students maximum. And you were connected to everyone. You were connected to um, the older students and the youngest students. And in the Waldorf school that I'm going to now, I know the students in my class, but I don't know the students who are older and the students who are younger. When you are going to a big school, you are not connected to the, to the youngest. And society doesn't really accept the fact that you may want to be in touch with the youngest um, children, with the younger children. Something that happens in many schools and that many students are aware of and many parents are also aware of, when we have to take our children to school, we um, sometimes wonder, 
there are schools that may look interesting for primary school. And then we wonder, uh, will this be negative when it comes to uh, changing to secondary school? What are your experiences? When you, the important thing is that when you move from primary school to secondary school, you need to be safe. If you don't feel safe, um, that may be dangerous. What I realized when I uh, went from primary to secondary school is that you see things in a different way. In uh, primary school, everything was safe. Uh, there was a community. But things change. In a normal school, you cannot uh, talk to everyone about your experiences. You're going to be judged. And for me, that's the most important difference. Parents are usually worried about whether children will be able to um, learn things in a, with a different educational approach. But that's not the issue. If you know how to listen, you know how to do any anything. That's what you mentioned, too, that some parents were a little bit afraid. You came from a school that prepares you for life, right, which is very important. That's what many parents say. Yes, but what happens later? What's the change? Is it that hard to move from one school to the other, one educational approach to another one? You're not understanding. OK, everything that you learned in primary school when you were a girl? Uh, is it useful? Or when you change systems, uh, things are going to go really bad? What I learned in primary school, I am using every day, also in secondary school. I would say that, in general, everything that I learned in San Javors, I'm um, using every day to meet people. I already said this before. We want to leave some time for people to make questions. I would like to wrap up, but I don't want to talk too much, but I have been thinking um, about using this opportunity to, of talking to so many people and raising awareness. This is something that I was not aware of until six months ago. An experiment was done um, placing a light detector connected to a piece of paper. Uh, do you have the power of reading someone's mind? Well, we don't have the power of reading someone's mind. It's incredible to see how plants do have this power. The scientists who carried out this experiment that I'm telling you about observed that there was a constant um, straight line in the scan of this light detector. And when the scientists thought, how can I make this change? How about if I burn the plant? And uh, a, a beep was heard and the line changed. When that idea of burning the plant was created, the plant felt that there was a danger there. And if we connect this, well, Eddie told me about this. I didn't know about this experiment that I'm telling you about. If a fire starts at the beginning of a forest, at the end of the forest, um, trees start shedding their leaves. And that means that trees are interconnected. If you throw a can in the middle of a in the middle of uh, the forest, trees are watching you. You should know that uh, trees are watching you when you litter the forests. There is a line that surely most of us sitting here have heard, because all teachers are told that we are educating boys and girls for jobs and professions that do not yet exist. I refuse to believe that we're educating employable people. I want us to educate integral, complete people who are able to go into that new world. So I would like for each one of you here, each one of you kids, to ask or to say something to the teachers who are here, or to say something to them that normally you have not had the opportunity to say, 
perhaps advice or a question or ask them something that you would like to know, say something you would like them to hear about, and then we'll have some questions. We have 500 teachers here listening to us. Well, there's some pressure there. For me, what worries me most about education is that there's many teachers who are not aware of the huge repercussion that their work has on the people that they're teaching. So I think it's really important. And the fact that you are here already takes you off the list of people who are not aware of that. But if you could tell your colleagues you know, that your impact is huge. Be aware of that. If you're starting to get boring in your work, in your dynamics, perhaps you don't want to innovate anymore, or you get comfortable in some way, I think it's really important to remember that that has a repercussion and an impact. If you need a change, then change. But don't just trundle along in a way that it means that you're teaching in a way that harms perhaps more than it does good. What would you say, Blay? I would like to give them some advice. An older person told me that it's better to learn than to understand. If you understand something, perhaps you memorize it in an exam. OK, so if you learn something, then you might forget it after the exam. But if you understand it, then that's where it will stay with you for life. My advice is to feel love for what you do. Don't teach just for the sake of teaching. Give it a sense. Because you're affecting literally millions of people along the way. Because there's the kids that you have in front of you and those who come behind and the generations after them everyone will feel the impact of your teaching. It's a chain of learning. And if we all cooperate, then we can make it better. I would say connect with your students at a personal level. If somebody has difficulties, doesn't understand something, try to understand why they're having these difficulties. So connect, right? And be like an uncle, like an aunt. What I would like to say to you is that maybe you have students who seem uninterested, who are not listening to what you're saying. But at the end of the day, everybody wants to learn stuff. And the search of how to teach them at a personal level, emotional level, being an idol who can teach them something, you can make even the most uninterested kids have interest within them. It is there, hidden, so you need to find it. I just want to say that it's really important when you're doing work that is as important as this, not to be fearful, to work from the space of love and to always have an open mind. Because I think these structures that we have in our heads are something that, as I've said, was introduced to us as we were kids through TV and regular schools. And in an alternative school, I have had the opportunity to see it differently. And homeschooling, for example, I think by meeting even kids who have been in homeschooling or different schools, you can see the difference. They don't have in their heads the idea of competition. Uh, you have to beat the others because they otherwise will get more than you do. That mentality of hierarchy, of being above or below, of conquering. Be clear that there are many 
people in this world living in ways we cannot even imagine, with ways of life that are based on things that we don't ever see here. So just understanding those ways of life, kids can then create their own. So keep your mind open, always. I don't have I don't have a question. I have an, an anecdote of a kid whose name I won't mention, but it may help a little bit teachers because sometimes to understand why a student may not ask something. This kid, I'm sure you know him, almost all the class would tease him, would tease him even more than me <laughs> because at one point I, I just decided to ignore people who teased me. But this kid had a doubt once in a class. He went home. He spent all day thinking of how to ask that question for him so as not to be teased. He made that question the next day, and even so, they teased him. And so a teacher said something that for me was just such an impact. How can it be that a child needs to spend six hours thinking of a question, of how to ask a question so as not to be teased? If I need five minutes for something, you need five hours, then it's nobody's fault. Nobody should be teased for that. I don't really know what to add because I think we've said it all. I'd like to underline everything that you've all said. And yeah, it's about teaching with love, teaching cooperation, how to help each other, and creating a safe space in which to grow because we can have all the advances and techniques in the world, but if we don't have union and empathy and a connection that is strong between people that allows people to help each other and cooperate, then there won't really, there's not much to do. There's not many solutions possible. So all of that and also be aware of creating ethics and morals that are strong and good And so everything that emerges from that can only be positive. And thank you so much, everyone. It's been really enriching to listen to you all and to hear your invitations to everyone who is here as teachers. And I will sum up with what Victor has said at the end. School needs to be a place where we can grow in safety. And I think that is fundamental. If anyone has any questions before we finish this session, this is the moment. Any questions or comments? Hello, good morning. I don't want to ask a question. I want to make a small comment. I'm here because I'm a teacher, but first of all, I'm here because I'm a mother, because I'm a family, I'm a sister, I'm an aunt. And I think that this is something that as a teacher, as teachers, we sometimes lose that perspective. We're here because we're people. The kids there have said in their, in their remembering, they remembered a teacher. They remembered someone who walked with them, someone who listened held their hand. So now in the beginning of school, we have so many meetings. Do we ask the families what they want, what they're concerned about? Do we ask the kids what they want, what are they concerned about, what are they worried about? It's as if as teachers we know this and so we feel we know it already and we just go ahead and teach. So we need to amplify this vision of community, make it real, and to ask everybody, the kids, the families, the cleaning lady, everyone who's involved in the community. Because as you said, as you said it is society. Thank you.
Socrates said many years ago, speak so I may know you. And that's what we want, is we want to ask people stuff. We want to ask them and know their opinion. Hello, I wanted to remind you of the words of a, a very wise Greek man from 2,000 years ago, Plutarco, who said, the mind is not a bucket to be filled, but a lamp to be ignited. So as Felipe was saying, the differences between larger schools and smaller schools, uh, I was remembering a debate you held two years ago talking about bullying. And Satish said, summed it up in three words, make small schools. Thank you very much. So we've come to the end. We want to thank all of you who've been up here with us. It's been a real luxury to listen to you. We've all learned a lot, which is great to start the day off with. Thank you so much. A una llamada al mundo entero. Ayudadme a gritar que queremos paz. Mucho amor para Emmanuel Yao. That's why it really kind of baffles me That we cannot end wars and bring peace And we cannot change the way people act And we cannot change the way people think So if we sit back, chill out and relax Civilization will soon be extinct That's why I am I'm calling on the, I'm calling on the whole wide world I wish the world was a little bit fair. Time to start looking at the man in the mirror. Fear is the devil policeman. Fear make good genocide with Hitler so he can. Feel a war of genocide and I'm a good weekend. Lighting up the land cause nobody was speaking. That's why I am. I'm calling on. I'm calling on the whole wide world. Come on people, would you help me? Let's scream and shout, cause we want peace. To say the least, somebody said after Rwanda. And after Rwanda, and not far from Rwanda. Who's gonna shout for the poor people living and die for? The world gone deaf, the world gone blind, the world busy sitting down on the behind. Nobody cared about the poor and needy. To be me sucking up to the rich and the greedy. For every
want peace. We want peace. We want peace. We want peace. And you You have to you have thirty thirty minutes or oh, thirty five, don't okay. worry. Okay. Take your time. Okay. Bueno, és, és un honor per mi és presentar en, en John Handai, és un home que quan vaig saber... Um, com... It is an honor for me to introduce John Dandai. And there's so much that this man can help us with because everyone who we invite shares their experience, their wisdom, their light when it comes to understanding life and what is important in life. He comes from Thailand, where he has created a school, a learning school, where they understand that self-learning is essential. And it's about how do we share with people and he's created this self-sufficiency school, and he's also created a movement of families that make their own homes. And that is very important in his country, and many more things. So I leave you with him, John. Good morning, everyone. Um, first thing I want to say that I'm not educator. I'm farmer. So, but today I want to share my experience about education because I feel like uh, it may be useful for some people. I don't know the situation in Thailand and here is the same or not. When I was grew up, everybody said, if you want to have a successful life, you need to get education. High education is the best. So everybody was taught like that. I think about, I want to have a successful life too. So I try to get high education. But because I'm poor, I cannot get very good education. So I do self-learning a lot. And then I try until I finish high school. Mainly I study by myself. I read book, read book by myself and go take the exam. And then I went to university, three years in university. I started to think I spent so much time for learning, almost 16 years in this, this education system. But I feel like I don't know anything. So what do I learning? What did I learn? So I start to think about, I have so much problem in my life. But I learned for 16 years, I don't know how to solve any problem in my life. And I start to see people around me. There are so many people who finished university. And then they become jobless people. How can people who have knowledge have no job? What's the meaning of knowledge that we learn? What is it for? So that makes me think, why do we need to learn to be a jobless people? So that means those knowledge that we learn from education system is useless. I start to think about that a lot. And then I have my personal problem. I feel really low self-esteem because I grew up in the area that people in the whole country consider second-class people, like a poor and uneducated. So people from my area just to be a uh, labor worker in the city, mainly. So we feel shy. I feel very shy. I feel very low self-esteem. 
when I went to Bangkok, it's very hard for me to find a job because I'm so shy to go to be interviewed to get a job. I walk past the office three times, four times. I'm not brave enough to go to apply for a job. At the end, I need to be, I have to be a security guard for many years. And then I learn, read a lot of books. And it made me think about why I'm so shy and how can I get rid of shyness in my life. I think about what I learned from primary school until high school until university. No knowledge that I can help myself. So I start to experiment, experiment with myself. How can I conquer my problem? I cannot think anything else. What I learn doesn't help me. So I think about, I want to face the problem, confront the problem, Con confront with myself. I feel shy because I feel low self-esteem. I feel poor. I feel I have nothing. That make me afraid of so many people, I'm afraid of strangers. So I, one day in Bangkok, I just dress with very old clothes, a lot of hole, and then wear the flip-flop, different color. I pick up from the trash can. I walk in the city, and people look at me, and then I can see from their eyesight, they look down on me very badly. I notice that my feeling is very, feel very bad. I feel shy more. I feel like I can't stand it. Why I have to do like this? But my consciousness tells me that I have to do like this to see what is the end of Chinese. Why I am so shy? If I be with it for long enough, what will happen? So I be with my feeling shy, my, that bad feeling for a long time. And I notice that my feeling bad is going up high, 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 high. And not very long, I feel like I can't stand it. I have to stop it. And then not very long, it's going down. When it's going down, I feel normal. I'm very really normal. What's wrong? I did not do anything wrong. I just wear normal clothes. But it's not look nice, that's all. I'm not very wrong. It come up again. My bad feeling come up again and going down. I start to notice that the world has no problem. Only my feeling have problem. So, and I start to observe my feeling that when it go up, it's always going down, and going down, always going up. So every time when I feel shy, I will say, let it go. Soon it's going down. So that's what I learned. So I feel like this kind of learning helped me a lot. It changed my life completely. It made me feel like I have some tools to help myself to solve the problem. So whenever I feel bad, whenever I feel unhappy, I will not run away from it. I've been facing it. When I'm facing it, be with it for a while, I start to see it, what happened. So mainly it just comes from feeling. So from this experience, it helped me to think about education. Because education that we have now is not for understanding. It's just to try to make people become a computer. How can we make people remember as much as you can? So remembering is not last very long. If you don't use it, you forget it. And then remembering if you have so much in your brain, you have no space in your brain for imagination. You cannot imagine. I feel like 
This is the most dangerous thing in the world, is education system. Because I start to see education system we have now just is what designed by capitalist system to make people numb. So people don't have time to think about love, freedom, and happiness. Why? Because these three things is a big obstacle of capitalism. When people love each other, that that's mean people care each other more, help each other more. People buy less and consume less. If people have freedom, that means people can help themselves more. They cannot they don't rely on the system much. So it's not good for the system, not good for economies. And if people are happy, happy people are people who consume less. If you consume less, you enjoy your life more. But if you consume more, you need to work harder. When you work harder, you have no time to be with yourself, no time to be with family. You suffer more, so you can consume more. And you're unhappy, be more unhappy. So that's why I, that's what I see from the farmer's eye that this is a system were designed by capitalism. So, I start to think about education system now is like a slave factory to produce slave, to work, to serve the business sector, to try to change good people into a good robot. No thinking, not thinking, just Listen to the command and, order and follow the command. So that's the main theme, the main goal of education. So I start to think crazy like this for a long, long time. And at the end, I just start to feel like I need to stop learning. Because I waste so much time in my life for learning something that I never use it. I learn a lot of things. I don't like math, but I was, I was forced to learn for many years. But now I never use pi, I never use psi, cos 10, I, know, I never use square root in my life. I spend so much time learning it. But what I need to use, they never teach me in the school. So it makes me have very negative believe negative thinking about education system a lot. So I quit university after three years. I feel like uh, it wastes a lot of time. And then I went back home. I start to think about how can people who are not clever like me can be happy on this earth? can enjoy my life. Because it's not only me, there are so many people like me. How can we live on this earth happily? When I went back home, I feel like I cannot be a villagers anymore. When I was in the city, I feel like I cannot be a city people anymore. Because city people is like a robot. They work hard, make money, spend money, make money, and spend money. That's all they do all their life. So they cannot think about fun, nothing fun. So when I went back home to my village, I cannot be villagers too, because villagers start to work harder and harder. Before that, my village, people work only two months a year. And another 10 months is free time. They have a lot of fun. They play a lot, laughing all the time. But when I went back home, after I left the city, the whole village working harder. After they grow rice, they start to grow corn. After they grow corn, they start to grow cassava or tapioca. No day, no day off, harder than people who work in the city. So I started to think, why people have to work so much? When they work a lot, but they are poor. The more they work, the more they're in debt. The 
the more they work, they have less thing to eat. What are we working for? Who are we working for? So I question a lot. So I feel like uh, I'm the black sheep in the world alone. I cannot talk with anybody. Everybody think I'm crazy. Your thinking is not normal. The world just be like this. So I start to think about, I don't need to think about successful life. I just think about, we need to have food to eat. We are human. Why we don't have enough to eat? Why we think we are poor? I look at the dogs in the city. One dog, they, she stay under the bridge. This dog never go to school. No credit card, cannot read, cannot write. But this dog has four babies at a time. They can raise four babies happily. But human like me don't have anything to eat. That's the biggest crisis. People like me who can read, who can write, have no job to do. That's the crisis of thinking. That reminds me about we need to be normal anymore. Now we are not normal anymore. We make our lives so complicated until we don't know how to live on this earth anymore. We work so much until we don't know how to have free time. We don't have even time to think about what is happiness, what is freedom. When we think about freedom, the system told us that if you need freedom, you need to have money. You have freedom, if you want freedom, you need to have cell phone. You need to have this women pad. You need to have this credit card. That's freedom. But actually, they try to brainwash us to tell us that black is white, white is black. That's not our freedom. It's money freedom. Money is not our self. When we have no money, money can, be go, can go away from us any time. But when we have no money, what can we do? So, that's not real freedom. Real freedom must be f from inside us. That made me think about the education need to based on the four basic needs. Food. We need to be able to rely on ourselves on food. Know how to grow food. Know what is edible. Know how to cook. That's the most basic thing. The second thing is shelter. We need to have a house to stay. The house must be cheap and easy for everybody. And then the next thing is clothing. We need to have clothes to wear. It don't need to be fancy. Anything is fine. And then the last thing is healing, medicine. We need to help ourselves in when we get sick. This four thing is the basic thing that we need to learn in the beginning of our life. But education system just don't teach us anything about this. Four basic needs is like the roots of our life. If we have strong roots, we are stable. We have less fear. We can be anywhere. We have less worry. That means freedom. But the ed education system just cut our root off. Now we don't know what to eat. We need to go to the supermarket only. We don't know how to grow anything. We don't know how to start a fire to make the fire anymore. We don't know how to make a house. We don't know how to do anything, even clothes, even things that we use in our life. We don't know anything. When we get sick, they always say, you need to go see a doctor. Why we need to go see a doctor? It's our body. Why we don't know our body? Why we don't teach us about our body? So, that makes me start to think about, I need to study these four basic things first. I start to grow vegetable, grow rice. What I learn is I spend only one hour per day to take care of the garden the same size with this room. I water the garden only 15 minutes per day. 
and weeding and everything and pick up things, not more than one hour per day. But I can produce enough food to feed six people. I start to think, why I'm so stupid? I work in Bangkok for seven years. I work eight hours per day every day, but not enough to feed one person. But when I come back home, I work only one hour. I feed six people per day, every day. And I still have leftover to sell, to have income. I feel life is so easy if you get out of the system. And after that, I want to have a house. To have a house like a normal people is a big thing. You need a lot of money. So many people spend more than 30 years to be in debt to have a house. So I feel hopeless when I think like normal people. One day I look at the birds. The birds has no saw, there's no hammer, but the bird can make a very beautiful nest in two days. They never go to school. Why I cannot make a house? That make me make decision easily that I want to make a house. So I got a knife and I cut the bamboo and make a small house. It's too small to say house, so I call a hut. But it's very comfortable, very nice. The most, uh, what I like it most is I clean my house only one minute per day. <laughs> so that makes me save a lot of time in my life. Just imagine how many people who clean their house more than one hour per day. Just cleaning, rubbing the same place every day. So I feel like I love small house. And after that, I experiment to build Adobe house. I'm the first person who started Adobe house in Thailand. I work only two hours per day, from five o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock in the, in the morning, every day. My friend who is a teacher, he wake up five o'clock every day, and he run every day, exercise. After three months, I got a house with small amount of money and very strong, stable house. But after three months, my friend still running. He still exercise and running. So I feel like I got exercise too, like my friend. And I got a house. And I feel, how is so easy? Why people have to spend 30 years to have a house? Some people spend all their life to pay off the debt of their house. Why we have to make house become something complicated and hard when we can do it easy like this? So I start to notice that if we don't go to the school, we can build a house. But everybody who goes to education system, it's very hard to make a house. I saw many villagers who did not get very high education. Most of them can build their house easily. So. I start to do many things myself. My, I make soap by myself. I make toothpaste by myself. I make shampoo by myself. Because I feel like, why human have to buy something that we don't use it? Like if we want, want shampoo to shampoo our hair. We just want shampoo. The cost of shampoo is less than one cent. But we buy for many euros for one bottle. Actually, we buy a bottle, an advertisement. Do we need a bottle to shampoo our hair? We don't need it. We just need shampoo. Why we have, why we have to pay a lot of money for packaging? So now I just think about how many people in the world work so hard to make money just to buy something that we don't use it, mainly packaging and advertisement. So that's. That's crazy. This is the crisis of thinking. We ruin the whole world. Just for what? We don't need a bottle of water. We just want a water to drink. 
But the cost of the bottle is more expensive many times than the cost of water that we drink. We have so many universities on, on this earth. What are we learning now? We're learning to be something stupid like this. Huh? So that makes me more exciting to do things myself more and more and more. So I make yogurt, I make sauce, I make everything. It's so much fun when you do it. And then you feel like you don't need to work a lot just to have a money to buy expensive shampoo. You spend only a few euros, you can make one batch of shampoo. You can use for two years in the whole family. It's so cheap and easy. So, and the last thing that I worry most is if I quit my job and then there's no money, no insurance, when I get sick, what will happen? I worry a lot about that. I have a lot of fear, a lot of worry about sickness. I afraid I am going to die. So I start to think, what is good thing of sickness? Because everything on this earth, they always have both sides, positive and negative, good and bad. But we look at sickness only bad thing. That means I have the wrong eye, wrong thinking. I need to find what is the good thing of sickness. So I contemplate for a long, long time. At the end, I discovered that sickness is very good thing. The first good thing is, is the signal from our body to tell us that I did something wrong. That's why I get sick. So when the body sent the signal to me, I need to stop everything and come back to look at myself. What did I do wrong? Did I eat bad food? Did I work too much? Did I work close to chemical or radioactivity? Or if I cannot find, what happened with my thinking? Did I think something wrong? My belief wrong? So, sickness is like a something to remind us to come back to find the cause, to find what did we do wrong before it's too late. So it's a good thing. Whenever I got sick, I stop everything and come back to contemplate. What did I do wrong? This is the first thing of good side of sickness. And the second side of the second thing of sickness is Sickness is only one thing that brings me back to myself easily. Normally, I don't be with myself. My mind is somewhere out all the time. I always spend my thinking about work, about money, about movie star, about politician, about someone who I love, who I don't love. So my mind is just outside most of the time. In one year, I start to think, how many minutes in one year that I think I'm breathing? How many in one year that I think I'm still alive? I never think about myself at all. Until when I get a cold, I cannot breathe. That's the only time that I come back to myself easily. I feel like, oh, breathing is so important. When I got sick, I cannot move. I have a headache, I feel uncomfortable, but I cannot run away from it. I have to be with that feeling. So that's the time I be with myself. So when I was with myself, is the time I can understand myself. Before that, I just outside. I was outside so much. I never be with myself. So when I got sick, I cannot run away from myself. I be with myself for a long time. And then I start to see myself like, oh, my life is nothing. I don't have much time on this earth. What can I do the rest of the time, the rest of my life? Our life is very short. So we need, what is the most important thing to do? So that makes me think back to myself more. Before that, I never think like this. I always think I'm still young, I'm still healthy. 
So I intoxicate myself a lot. Drink, get drunk all the time, go anywhere. Don't care about myself because I think I'm still young. But actually I can die any time. So sickness is a good thing. So to think like this, it makes me feel very relaxed. I don't worry about sickness much. But anyway, sickness is a normal thing. We cannot avoid it. Everybody has to face it. But what, when it happens, what can I do? I start to do self-healing. I start to learn alternative way of healing. That helped me a lot. I did not refuse conventional medicine, but I helped myself first. If I cannot help myself, I will go to conventional medicine. So after I start to come back home and learn how to help myself in these four basic needs, my life completely changed. I feel like life is so much fun. This is a real freedom. I don't need to feel like a, I'm poor again. There's no poor, no rich in my mind anymore. Poor is suffering. Rich is suffering. The more you have money, that means you have more burden. If you have less money, you have more problems. So, I'm not poor, I'm not rich. I'm just a normal people who enjoy my life. I have a lot of food. I have a good place to stay. I have a good house. I have material to use in my life. I have a good family. That makes me feel like, a, what is more important than this on this earth? So, I feel like I finished my school after that. Now I'm ready to die because, because I did everything I wanted. I enjoy everything I want to enjoy it. So that's fun. So now I start to see the whole world Billion and billion of people, everybody work more than eight hours per day. But most of people work very hard. Just try to digest it, the limited natural resources into money. Very few people who work hard to grow more natural resources. I feel like, what are we learning? Why we learn to consume only, but we don't learn how to grow more? I see people in my village, they do farming for a long time, and now all, they're so diligent, they work so much. Before they, they work only two months a year. They use chemical in their farm only one time a year. But now they grow three or four crops a year. So they use more than eight times of chemical in their land. So the more farmer diligent, they kill the soil more and more and more. So the soil turned to dead soil all over the world, million, million of acres everywhere, every year. So you can see the dead soil expand very fast. And the more we diligent, the more we work, the water contaminates with chemical. Now, the studies show that in many areas, underground water contaminates with chemical deeper out, up to 25 meters. Now, we have no water to drink. We are so clever, we know everything, we can go to the moon, but we kill ourselves. We have more water than the soil on this earth. But today, we need to buy water to drink. This is a crisis, the biggest crisis, but nobody thinks it's crisis. People think this is civilization. I have a nice bottle of water to drink. But actually, that's crisis. We work hard. We used to have forests everywhere, but now, 
the whole world, we have less than 15% of forest. In Thailand, we used to have more than 20,000 varieties of rice. We developed so much, now we have only 200 varieties of rice left in Thailand. We have more than 2,000 varieties of freshwater fish. But now the whole country eat only three varieties of freshwater fish. This is biggest crisis in the world. But nobody study about this. Nobody bring this into practice. So that makes me think about we need to rethink about education system. How can we educate ourselves to free ourselves? Because education system that we have now is not to free ourselves, just to train ourselves to be a good slave. Work hard, make hard. Work very hard, make money, spend money, make money and spend money. Don't think about anything else. So that helped me to change my mind a lot. Now, I don't want to send kids to school. All my kids, all the kids in my community, we do homeschooling. We create our own curriculum for them. So they learn to be a normal animal. So we don't need to be robot. So that's the idea. So now, one thing I feel like a, I don't have many things for my son. I have one son. I don't work and save money for my son like many people. But I try to save natural resource for my son. So my main job now is to do seed saving. Because seed is food. Food is life. If no seed, there's no food. The seed disappears from this earth every day. Never come back. So that means we are closer to the biggest crisis more and more and more. So we start to saving seed. I did not refuse money. I use money and spend money like normal people. But when I have money, I don't deposit money in the bank. I don't save money in the bank. I use money to buy land. Because land is more stable, more secure than money. I feel like the money is not secure anymore. Why so many people still working hard, try to save money for security. Because money is the most vulnerable thing in the world right now. Inflation rate is very fast. The money is going to collapse soon. Why the money have to collapse? I think in my perspective, like a, I'm not economist. I don't know economist's word. So I see that where is money come from? Money comes from digesting the natural resource into money. But now we don't have enough natural resources to change into money anymore. But we have so much money on this earth, but less natural resources. Money and natural resources is something go along together. If we have more money, we will have natural, less natural resources. And if we have more natural resources, we have less money. And then, what do we need money for? We just need money to buy natural resources, to feed our life. We don't use money to feed our life. So I think that's... You go around the bush so far. Why we need to save money for security? Why we don't save natural resources for security instead? So that makes me think different from many people. We don't save money, but we save natural resources. We, we get money, we buy land. And when we get land, when we got land, we stop using chemical, stop burning, and stop taking branches or leaves away. Just dump in there, dump in there. Not many years, the soil start to be good soil quickly if we don't disturb it too much. The soil start to develop itself very quick. And then we start to grow trees, grow food. We start to make a heaven 
for ourselves. Heaven means we have everything we need. We have forest, good shade. On the tree, there's a lot of fruit, a lot of wood for building, for make tool, for everything, for medicine. Above the ground, there's a lot of grass, there's a lot of vegetable. Underground, there's a lot of roots, jam, potato, turmeric, many things underground. So that's heaven. We got everything there. We don't need to die before we go to heaven. Because if we wait until we die, we maybe cannot go to heaven. Because we cannot bring cell phone with us. We have no GPS. We maybe lose the way somewhere. So enjoy the heaven now and die. That's the end of it. So that's the way I think it's fun to live like this. So now we create a small heaven in our place. We grow more trees. We have food. We have communities. Many people live together. And we have good family. I think nothing more important than this. I think education needs to based on four basic needs. So everybody can have ability to build their own heaven. Heaven is here and now. Don't die first. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, so now we go on to the break. So now we have a half an hour break. Thank you so much, John. And two things for people. One is that they need to buy the tickets for lunch. You don't, the speakers. And secondly, but people who have projects that are happening and that you'd like to share them with the rest of us. On the left, as you walk out, there's a filming team, and you can go and talk about your project, and then tomorrow we will see and hear the video of all these projects. So we'll see you again in half an hour. Please be punctual. Thank you.